thank you. Um, so just a little bit about who I am. Um, you know, you know my name. Um, I am director of core technology at Mauerbytes. Uh, you can find me on Mastodon here at Thomas A. Reed. Um, you can also find me over on the, that bird site. Um, I'm not very active there anymore, but you can find me there. Uh, and these are a couple websites, my personal blog and my Instagram feed. Um, so let's go ahead and get on with it. First, we're gonna start out with the basics of incident response on Mac OS. Um, so what we're gonna be covering today is all about identification of a problem. So you've got a Mac in your org, you think that it might've been infected with something and you just wanna fix the problem. Um, so you need access to the Mac um, and you kinda need to look for what's suspicious um, on the machine and what else happened with that machine that might be related to whatever you're seeing that's suspicious. What we're not going to be talking about is forensic data collection. Um, you know, this is where you really need the data to stand up to time. You need it for legal evidence or something along those lines, um, documentation. Um, that's out of scope for today. Also out of scope is any mention of EDR um, or endpoint detection and response, which is where you have some security software that's logging a lot of activity. We're not going to talk about how to analyze that activity. Uh, although once you kind of start learning how to um, examine a Mac and look for suspicious behavior and things like that, then you'll start to get a feel for how you might be able to use EDR data as well. So uh, before we get started, I'm just going to give you a list of some tools here. If you want to screenshot this, uh, these are all open source tools. They're all aimed at gathering uh, a lot of incident response data. Um, the first one is one that I wrote. The rest are from um, other folks in the industry. Um, uh, these are all real good tools. And the nice thing is, since they're all open source, you can examine the source code. And you can figure out exactly how all these tools are gathering information. And you can use that to help learn how to um, gather more information that you, you might not have even known was there. So there are a lot of areas of importance when you're doing this sort of thing. Um, you know, here's just a list of some of them. Um, you're going to Generally speaking, you're going to be looking at all kinds of things like this and sort of building a timeline. Um, today, since you know we're on a fairly limited schedule, we'll only have time to really talk about the first one here. And on macOS, that's often the most important one. If you look at methods of persistence, that is often your key to figuring out what's going on and whether a Mac is infected or not. Um, almost all malware on Mac these days uses some form of persistence. There are very few, uh, very rare, that actually rely on you opening an infected application and don't actually have any other form of persistence. Uh, but that's pretty rare. Most of the time, you're going to find stuff by looking for these methods of persistence. Um, so there is a lot to look at when it comes to uh, persistence on Mac OS. Um, some of the most common uh, are launch agents and daemons. We'll talk about what exactly those are in a few minutes. Um, also login items, and there are a couple different types of login items. Uh, browser extensions are also very commonly used particularly by adware more so than than the more malicious kind of stuff um, and then there are some other things that are a little less frequently used like cron tasks and login hooks and a number of abusable scripts and stuff like that um, those have been used but they're they're fairly rare these days and then finally system configuration profiles um, we'll talk a little bit more about those as well those are typically used more by adware uh, because they can do certain things that the adware folks really like uh, fi and find very useful so we'll start out with the launch agents and daemons if you're not familiar with mac os um, these are 
actually fairly simple. There is a .plist file somewhere on the system that defines the behavior. So it, it identifies what process is going to get launched and under what conditions. Um, some of those conditions can be like, you know, at, at login, it can be at startup. Um, it can define that the process needs to be kept alive at all times. So if something terminates the process or it crashes, it's going to immediately launch again. Um, and these are very, very commonly abused by malware. Uh, that dot p list, uh, that means property list. This is a special XML format that Apple uses. Um, and these files can be in certain predefined locations, which makes them really easy to find and examine. Um, so there are three primary locations that you'll find for third-party software. Um, that is in the users library slash launch agents folder. And then in the uh, root level library slash launch agents or launch daemons folders. Um, so you'll just find the .plist files in there. They will refer to an executable somewhere else on the system. Um, it could really be anywhere. And that executable will get launched according to the, the criteria that the plist defines. There are a couple of new ones as of macOS 13, uh, aka Ventura. And, and these are internal inside of an app. So if you're not familiar with how Mac apps work, uh, a Mac app looks like a file when you look at it in the Finder. But really, it's a special folder with a, a specific structure and the finder treats it like a file, but you can dive inside that folder and look at its contents. Um, and so if you look in an app on Ventura, you might find inside of its bundle, you'll find the contents folder, then the library folder inside that. And there may be a launch agents or launch daemons folder there. And that can also hold uh, .plist files. In this case, those .plist files should be referring to an executable somewhere else inside that same app bundle. Um, so the goal here is to make the app completely self-contained uh, so that all parts of it are, are in the same folder. Uh, and if the user then drags that app to the trash, they don't have to go hunting around for all these other little bits and pieces scattered all over the system. Um, and these can be a little sneaky because they are in a different location now. Um, so you do have to kind of look inside various apps to find these. Um, now here's an example of what a launch agent or daemon looks like. And this is a particularly suspicious one. You can see down there, you see the key program arguments. Uh, that is the, uh, the, the thing that tells the system what should get launched. The first item in the array that's, that follows that key, uh, the first item is the process that's going to get launched. And then any remaining items in the array are all parameters. Um, so here you can see that it's going to launch SH and it's going to use that to execute uh, this weird code here, it's going to echo this long string into base64 decode, then pipe that into Python, then pipe the results of whatever Python outputs into Bash. Uh, that's really highly suspicious, as I'm sure you probably already recognize. Um, and this is a moderately common thing that you'll find with suspicious launch agents and daemons. Um, you know, the seems like they feel like this sort of obfuscates what they're doing but i mean you couldn't get more obvious than this if you see a, a such a file that's you know putting something piping something through bash 64 decode there's there's not a legitimate plist out there that will do that uh login items are in several places um the old style login items uh, on older versions of Mac OS, they are in system preferences in the users and groups pane, and there will be a login items tab there. Um, that's where you know the user can go and create 
their own login items, they can add an app to that list and it will get launched when they log in. Um, apps can also add themselves to this list. Um, and so there's a, there's a number of pieces of malware that have done this over the years. Uh, on macOS Ventura, this login items list is now in a different place. It's in system settings, general, and then in login items. Um, so Apple just had to change things there and, and it's it gets a little confusing to find stuff in Ventura. Um, now, uh, there is a newer kind of login item, and these are a little stealthier, or at least they have been in the past. Um, and these are internal uh, kind of sandboxed login items that are part of an app. They're bundled inside of an app. So just like with the launch agents and daemons that we talked about earlier, this is an executable that's found inside the app bundle at contents, library, login items. Um, and anything in there will get launched at login. This was done primarily for apps distributed through the App Store that can't put launch agents or daemons on the system and can't add themselves to the login items list. Um, but this is really easy to abuse by adware and malware. Uh, and it's really pretty, uh, pretty good for that purpose because on all previous versions of Mac OS, these really weren't visible to the user at all. You might not know that these things were, were there or running. Uh, fortunately, in Mac OS Ventura, Apple now makes these appear in the login items list in system settings. Um, so that is one really beneficial change in Ventura. Um, you know, you can you have this one list now that will show you basically everything. Um, none of these things aren't hiding anymore. Browser extensions are also very popular, especially with adware. Um, you know, adware uses this to uh, change the behavior of your browser. Um, you know, could use it to snoop on what you're doing sometimes. Um, and Chrome is really the most prevalent browser that you'll find malicious extensions for. Um, and these things are stored in the, the folder listed at this long path here, you know, inside the Chrome, the, the Google slash Chrome folder in your application support folder. Um, and there can be other profiles besides default. So if you have created any additional profiles in Chrome, you may also find some extensions in a variety of other folders, uh, not called default, called other things. Uh, you can get a full list. So if you're looking at a user's machine, you don't know if they have Chrome profiles, different profiles set up in Chrome. You can look at this local state file uh, the path is listed here. Uh, that will outline any other profiles that are present, among other things. Um, so that can tell you not just that there are other profiles, but what the names of those profiles are so you can find the folder that they belong to. Uh, we also see some Safari app extensions being used by adware. Um, these are a little different than the old style Safari extensions that used to go in a particular folder um, and they would be loaded by Safari. These haven't been supported in uh, uh, quite a few years now and we really don't see any malicious um, old style Safari extensions anymore. Uh, but we do still see some of these newer style app extensions out there. And again, just like with the login items and the, the launch agents and daemons, on modern Mac OS, these are stored inside of an app bundle. Um, so you'll find them inside the app in content slash plugins. Uh, and inside that folder, you can find any number of .appx bundles. These again are bundles, just like an app bundle. Um, and what you can do, they, they may or may not be a Safari extension. So if you're looking through apps and you find some of these app X bundles inside that, that location, they could be Safari, they could be something else, they could be some other app extension. So what you can do is you can drill down into that app X bundle, look at its info.plist and you can see the path where you'd find that down there at the bottom. Um, if you look inside that info.plist file, 
look at the NS extension point identifier key. And that will tell you basically what kind of an extension that is. Um, and if it's in a Safari extension, it will mention Safari. That does mean that it's a little bit more difficult to enumerate these. You kind of have to look through all the applications and, and find these. Um, but yeah, once you know they're there, it's, it's not too difficult to, to write the code to do that. Um, cron is, uh, it's deprecated at this point, but it still works. Um, it's very rare these days on Mac OS, uh, but it is still used by some malware. And so, uh, you know, this is, if you're you familiar with Linux, you're probably already familiar with how this works. Um, but you can get a listing of all the cron tasks for the current user just using cron tab dash L. Uh, stands for list. Um, for the root user, you can also do sudo crontab l. Uh, and there, there has been malware that has used a root cron task um, before, you know, because it got root escalation. Um, and then you can look through, if you have many users on a particular machine, you can look at all of them. Uh, you just have to cycle through and, and do crontab for each username using the dash u flag. Um, login hooks. Uh, this is something, they're very old, they're deprecated, but again, they still work. Uh, actually, I haven't tested it on Ventura, but they still worked recently. Um, and these are extremely rare. At this point, they're probably not worth looking for unless you're looking at a very, very old system. Um, there is only one piece of software, and it's a legitimate piece of software that I'm aware of that still uses these. Um, so be aware that they exist. If you're looking at a, a particularly old system, you might still find these in use um, by something malicious, um, but probably not on a newer system. And then finally, uh, abusable scripts, really anything that's user editable that runs under specific conditions like opening the terminal, for example. Um, those are really easy to abuse by malware. So anything like .bash profile, .bash rc, .z profile, um, these all will run under certain conditions. Um, they don't require any special permissions to edit. And because they start with a dot, they will be completely hidden from the user's view in Mac OS. Um, so most users will not even know that these are there. If they open the terminal, they probably don't even know that these are even running. Um, so those are, those are good to look at, see if there's anything suspicious going on in those. I would say on most systems, unless you're a power user, you may not even have some of these files. Uh, if the malware manages to get root, there are some other files that require root to modify, such as slash etc slash profile or slash etc slash bash rc. Um, so you can look at those as well and just see if they have been modified. That's probably less common unless the malware has managed to get root permissions. Um, so as we wrap up this part of the talk, um, I just want to share a, a couple of links here. The first one here is a presentation to a full day workshop that I did uh, a few years back, um, all about how to do incident response on Mac. There's a ton of good information in this PDF. Um, and at the end of the presentation, it will walk you through the process of examining some data captured from actual infected machines and um, seeing if you can figure out what happened. Um, and the materials for the presentation are at the second link here. You can download those. Um, those are data that I collected from, I think it was four different machines that I infected with malware uh, it, expressly for this purpose so that we could you know, look at it. So uh, that, that'll give you a lot more information. Um, Lots of really, really good information in there. Uh, and, and, you know, if you have any questions about any of this, uh, you know where to find me, you know, either Mastodon or 
you know, if you're not there yet on Twitter, I, I, my DMs are open over there. I don't really do much over there other than DMs anymore. Uh, we'll save any questions till the very end. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and segue into the basics of photography. Uh, so I am a very serious amateur photographer. I'm not a professional, uh, but I've been doing it for decades now, um, since the film days. So I'd like to share a little bit about how to take better pictures with all of you. So what we're going to cover today, I'm going to try and stick to topics that will apply to fancy cameras. So what I'm referring to there is digital SLRs or the, the nicer cameras that have, you know, ex, you can change the lenses and stuff like that. Um, and cell phone cameras, because I know not everybody has a digital SLR, but most of you probably have a cell phone camera in your pocket. And the, the particular topics we're going to focus on are exposure, focus, and composition. Um, so we're going to just sort of, you know, skim along the surface of these. There's a ton to learn that, that we won't cover here. Um, but we'll start out with exposure. So most of you have probably taken pictures and you just click the button and take it. Um, and it's automatically exposed. The camera figures out, you know, how much light to let in, you know, how, how, uh, how to expose the image. And it works pretty well these days. But cameras, um, they tend to want to make the whole scene about 18% gray uh, on average. And so that works pretty well most of the time, but it doesn't always work. And you kind of need to know when that's going to fail you. So here's an example. So I, I took this picture of an elk in snow. And you can see that snow is almost exactly 18% gray. Uh, it doesn't look good at all. It's a, the image is way, way too dark. And that's because the camera is trying to make all of that white 18% gray. So here is a similar image that I took with an adjusted exposure. And you can see it looks much more natural. Now, what's really um, uh, a little bit counterintuitive here is that to um, because the camera is uh, darkening the image in intentionally, uh, you have to take this very bright image and you have to actually let more light in because the camera is darkening it. So um, you have to switch your exposure to let in more light. Um, and then conversely, if it's a dark image, uh, you have to actually let in less light and that's kind of counterintuitive that a, you want a bright image you want to let in more light but um that's the way it works and on on uh, uh cell phone cameras um at least on ios i know that there is a an exposure control uh so you can twiddle your exposure on ios as well as on a digital slr i would assume the same is true on android i don't have an android phone to test with though um, all right, now a lot of people like to take pictures of the moon. Uh, now the moon's up at night, but what you have to keep in mind is it might be night where you are, but it's sunny up there on the moon. It's full daytime. So uh, a lot of times when people take a picture of the moon, they end up with just this white circle. Uh, and, and so you can't see any of the detail on the moon. What you have to do is you have to adjust your exposure so that you're taking a picture as if it were daytime. Um, that might be a little more difficult on a cell phone camera. It's you know a lot easier if you use manual settings on a a digital SLR. Um, but you know you can you can twiddle the exposure on on a cell phone camera and and get something that works. Just you know keep trying, keep taking pictures and fiddling with the exposure till it looks right. Um, if you want to get some details, so you'll see in this left-hand picture, you can't see any stars or anything like that. That's because it's exposed as if it were daytime. So if you want some background details, like in this right-hand photo, uh, you really need to have some other source of light. So for example, this picture was taken when it was still, there was still a little bit of sunlight in the sky, which let us see the, the, 
uh, silhouettes of the trees in the background. Um, generally speaking with exposure, you can fix a lot later in an editor uh, if you have the data. And that's the problem. So there are a lot of things you can do with an exposure where you actually lose data. Um, you actually have really dark pixels that turn completely black, or you have really light pixels that turn completely white. Um, if, if that happens, there's no way to get that data back. Um, so in order to ensure that you don't lose any pixels that way, there's this thing called the histogram. And if you've got a digital SLR, you can probably view that on the screen on your, your, your camera. It'll look something like this image on the bottom left here. Uh, if you've got a phone camera, there's probably a histogram somewhere there. I know on iOS, if you're looking at the exposure settings, uh, if you look where the red arrow is pointing up there in the upper left corner of the iOS screen, there's a little rudimentary uh, uh, histogram there. And the idea here is you want to keep your histogram sort of in the middle somewhere. Um, if you find, if you're looking at that histogram on the bottom there, um, if you find that it's climbing up the right side or climbing up the left side, that probably means that you have lost some data. So you need to, you know, change your exposure to shift it more towards the, the center. Uh, and then as long as you've got it in the center somewhere, it may not be perfect, but you can edit it a little bit later and make it look perfect. So we're going to switch over to focus now. And um, one of the big problems with just snapping a picture, uh, just letting the camera focus for you, is that there are a lot of conditions where the autofocus is going to fail. So a photo like this one here, the heron is really just a small part of the photo. There's a lot of busy background. There's you know all those leaves in the background, some in the foreground. The camera is going to have a little difficulty figuring out what it should focus on in a case like this. So what you have to do is you have to learn to lock the focus separately from pushing the shutter release. So on a cell phone camera, for example, you can just touch the screen where you want to focus, and then you push the, the uh, shutter release or push the button to take the picture. On a digital SLR, there are a number of things you can do. A lot of them, you push the button halfway down and it'll focus, and then you can move the camera around a little bit and push it the rest of the way. Um, some also actually let you set two different buttons. So you can set one button to focus and the, uh, the, the shutter release will just do the shutter release, just take the picture. Um, and that's really useful. It, it's it's I think it's very useful to separate those two concepts. You want to focus separately from taking the picture. Uh, and that way you can focus on exactly what you want in the picture and don't let the camera choose for you. Uh, there's also a concept called depth of field. Uh, this is more relevant to digital SLRs. Um, and this is sort of how much of the screen is in focus. So when you focus, you're focusing at a particular distance between you and the camera and, and the subject. Um, now, the question is, you're, you, you know, how deep of a plane of focus do you have? Is it just a little narrow plane where everything's in focus? Or do you have a lot of material in focus, a lot of stuff? So you can see here in these two pictures, the one on the left, there's a lot more in the scene that's in focus, at least somewhat. You can see the background, it's still blurry, but it's a little bit more in focus than the one on the right. Um, and there's a way that you can deliberately choose with a digital SLR, and that's by controlling the aperture. The aperture or the f-stop is the, the hole in the lens and how big or small it is to let light in. Um, so a the f-stop number, the bigger the number, the smaller the hole. Uh, don't you know? Don't know why exactly that is, but when you use the larger f-stop numbers or a smaller hole, then you get a really deep depth of field. So like this left-hand image here, more of the picture is going to be in focus. And when you use a larger hole, 
or a smaller f-stop number, then you're going to get a picture like the one on the right where less is in focus. So you can tweak that to get exactly the look that you want. If you want the background blurred out, then you use a small, a, a, a smaller f-stop. Um, if you want, you know, more of the scene in focus, you use a larger f-stop. Now on a cell phone camera, you can't really control that per se, but you do have some other features like portrait mode on iOS that can help you get that blurred background look that you you might be looking for. Um, and that's kind of a substitute for controlling depth of field. Now we're going to talk mostly about composition here or you know how you arrange stuff in your your photo. Good technique can only get you so far. Um, you know, you can, you can, if you, if you use good composition, then just point and click photography can actually get great results. Um, and, and one thing I'd like to point out here is these are just guidelines. You can break these rules all you want if it gives you a picture that you like. Um, so what I'm going to tell you, these aren't hard and fast rules. So the first rule, so to speak, is the rule of thirds. Um, and this says that if you divide your frame up into thirds, both vertically and horizontally, um, that wherever those lines are, those are good places to place a subject, roughly. Um, and the intersections, the four, those four intersections where of lines are also good spots. And you can see here in this picture, you know, you've got the tree kind of roughly along one of those lines, and the horizons roughly along one of those lines. So that gives you good uh, placement of objects in the scene. Here's an example. You've got this mountain, but there's a lot of busy stuff in here. You know, it looks a little bit busy with trees and houses and stuff like that. If we change the composition, we get a lot more of the, that beautiful cloudy sky. You get less of the busy hillside in front with the houses and stuff like that. It's just a, a generally speaking, a more pleasing image. Um, also, you want to fill the frame with your subject. Um, so this is a day where uh, I was up on the ski hill and we were taking pictures and somebody had volunteered to take a picture for us. Uh, and you can see this picture here is the not the one that I took. This is one that somebody took for us. When you're taking a picture like this, a lot of people have the temptation, oh, let's turn on the ultra wide. You know, on iOS, you, you, know, you turn on that ultra wide and you're going to get everything. You're going to get this beautiful picture. Well, as you can see here, that didn't quite work out because we're tiny in the picture. The mountains in the background are tiny. You really can't see any detail. Uh, and you've got all of this chopped up snow in the foreground. It just doesn't, it, it's not a very pleasing picture. So ironically, if you've got this beautiful scenic, you're going to want to tighten in on that a little bit. You don't want to be, uh, you know, taking a really wide angle picture. You want to get tighter. And so here you can see you've got less of that that snow in the foreground, you've got more detail in the mountains, you can see the people in the picture better, uh, and you can see that sign across uh, the, the frame a lot better. Um, so generally speaking, you're going to want to try and fill up as much of the frame as you can with whatever your subject is. What, you know, and it may be a mountain, it may be a person, maybe a flower, you know, whatever it is, you want to fill up the frame as much as possible as you can with your primary subject. Uh, you also often are going to want to include a point of interest. So if you're looking at this picture, just those, you know, sort of hummocks of snow, those are really pretty. You could get a really nice sort of abstract looking photo with nothing but that. But by including this little tree in the picture, it kind of, you know, anchors it a little bit. It, it gives your eye something specific to focus on. Um, and, and I, in my opinion, I think that that would be a better photo than one without the little tree. Um, so when you've got something like this, sometimes it looks better in person than when you take the picture. Uh, and when you include that little object that, you know, 
that point of interest, that's what really makes the photo pop. Uh, now on a similar note, um, there are a lot of really beautiful vistas in the world and the Grand Canyon is one of my uh, go-to examples here. The Grand Canyon is undeniably spectacular. You go there in person, you look at it and it's just beautiful. It's amazing. And you get home and you look at the photos and you're like, huh, this doesn't look anything like what I saw. Like, this doesn't give me the same feeling. And it's because it's just a little bit too grand to capture in photos. Um, so when you see something like that, adding a, again, adding a little something in the foreground can really help to tie everything together uh, and give you a sense of scale as well. You know, you're looking at the Grand Canyon, you're like, well, how big is that? I can't really tell from the picture that I took how big it is. Oh, but now I've got this, this little bush here and a little bit of cliff, uh, stuff like that. Now I get a better sense of scale and a little more depth to the picture. Um, so it makes it a much more interesting photo. And then, um, Another really important point here is you want to choose your moment. Um, and this is particularly applicable to things that are uncooperative, like animals and toddlers. <laughs> They're very similar to photograph, actually. Um, and you'll see, you know, this is a pretty decent picture here, what we're looking at. You know, I mean, if uh, I bet if most of you took that picture, you'd be absolutely thrilled to have that bighorn sheep photo um but he's busy doing something else he's not really you know engaging with you in any way it's it's just a picture that shows you a bighorn sheep there was this one moment when i was photographing the sheep um and i i was there for for a little bit of time and he just happened to look up at me once just once and that was all it took i got this photo here uh, just at that right time, I would have missed it if I hadn't been ready and focused on him at the time. Um, and you can see that's a much more interesting photo because he's looking right at you. Um, he's even got this, you know, piece of grass hanging out of his mouth. Um, so it's, you know, you choose your moment with photos like this. You've got to be patient. You've got to be ready for something to happen. Um, and take that photo in that moment when something happens. And this is equally applicable, as I said, to things like toddlers. Um, it can also be applicable to things like uh, scenics. You know, you might think, well, that's not going to move. You know, what, what could possibly change? But the quality of light can change in an instant. You could have a cloud come over. You could have, you know, just the right light hit for just a moment. And if you're not ready, you might miss it. Um, so that's just a little bit of information on photography. There are a lot of other online resources. You know, I'm sure that you can find all kinds of things. There are YouTube channels that have lots of really good educational videos, websites, all kinds of things like that. One that I particularly liked, and I have no affiliation at all with, with uh, this company, is Creative Live. Um, they've got both free and uh, paid videos. Um, one that I particularly liked and thought was very, very helpful for me uh, were the videos by a guy named John Gringo. And um, he does some spectacular work and he explained himself and how he works very well in his videos. Um, so that's a good source if you want to learn more. Uh, most of those videos are going to focus more on digital SLRs, but there are some that focus on whatever camera you happen to have. Uh, and as some people like to say, the best camera is the one that you have. Because if you don't have a camera on you, you're not going to be taking any pictures. Any questions? Oh, you sure so do have some questions. And the fun <laughs> part of this conference is that you have to bounce back and forth between your talks in, in the context of the questions. So the first question that they have for you in the Slack is, 
With regards to AppX extensions, uh, do these AppX, AppX extension things inside the apps run only when the app itself is running, or do they get launched independently via some kind of startup item mechanism, et cetera? So that's a very good question. The app itself could potentially be running, uh, but the AppX extension itself would only be running when Safari is actually open. Or if it's not so if it's not a Safari extension, if it extends some other app, it'd be the same thing. Those only run when that app is open. All right, for our next question for you, why are login hooks considered deprecated only on old systems from Alex? So um, they are, uh, they're, they're deprecated now. Um, they've been deprecated for a long time. Um, the reason that I mention older systems for those is just because um, uh, they haven't been used actively for a number of years now. And so you, you'll find them much less frequently on newer systems. You might still find those being used by older malware on older systems. Uh, and that's malware that wouldn't run on a modern Mac, but it might still run on an older Mac. All right, and finally, um, maybe slightly off topic. I don't think it's off topic at all, Andrew. <laughs> it's a question on your photography topic. Do you have recommendations for photo software for quote unquote serious amateur photographers on newer <laughs> Mac OS if one is an aperture user? Yeah, so um, I used to be an Aperture user. Um, I kind of I switched away from it when Apple discontinued it. Um, right now, what I'm doing is I'm using Adobe Lightroom. I know I, I don't really like Adobe much, but Lightroom is a really good piece of software. Um, and I really don't use Photoshop, uh, really not at all these days. I, I can do you know, pretty much everything that I want to do with Lightroom. Um, one thing that I've made sure to do since the Aperture de debacle um, is I do not allow any software to manage my photos for me. So I keep my photos organized in folders myself, and then I just use Lightroom to view them and to edit them. Um, the other thing that I will use is actually Apple's Photos app. And, and really, I'm only using that for photos that I take with my phone. Um, it does have a, a more rudimentary editor built into it. Um, so it can help you edit your photos. Um, and it does get some really great results. Um, but you know, for photos from my digital SLR, I'm always going to use Lightroom because it, it does a much better job with those. <laughs> 